He was born in Napoli, Italy, studied in San Jose, California, has performed nationally and internationally, and today he's in our studio in San Bernardino. In a moment, a conversation with Italian tenor Pasquale Esposito. great to have you here in the studio and I'm flattered that I get to spend and our audience get to spend the next 26 minutes learning everything we could possibly know about you. Are you ready? <laughs> I am very ready. 26 okay. minutes. Here we go. <laughs> I can explain the entire life. Okay. <laughs> Good in 26 minutes. Okay so you knew at an early age, uh, I guess seven is what I was reading and when you were in Italy, that music was power, powerful and you wanted to sing, right? I'm gonna share with you a story, okay. and it is a real story. Uh, I was a, a, a young boy when during summertime they used to ship me to my grandparents to spend the summer with them. So I go there and of course I stay with Nonno Pasquale, I stay with Nonna Cristina. They, both of them were so passionate about music and they had this huge gramophone, you know, that you go and you, you don't need to go to the gym, you go like, <laughs> and you know. They had this huge gramophone and uh, we used to listen music. You know, a little TV, black and white, that took so long to turn it on. So, but we used to listen this uh, wonderful, he, he was an opera lover. So Mario Lanza, Enrico Caruso, all this wonderful tenor. And uh, yeah, we can spend so much time listening to this song and I can still remember the smell of that salsa and stuff like that. What happened is my grandfather tells me, do not touch the gramophone. When I am here, we can play the music together. Guess what? You touch the gramophone. He leaves, I break it. But I broke the head, you know? And I remember I was probably five, six years old. I break this thing, I go to my grandmother and say, look what I did. And she's like, you're gonna tell to your grandfather what you did. So I remember that night. I still remember the feeling. There is a certain moment in life that you will never forget. So that feeling, he comes back in that door and I go with that little piece of metal. I say, you know what, I, I broke it. I say, no problem. You broke the gramophone. It means that now, since we cannot listen to music, you're gonna sing it. Oh. And that was the first time that I had to do an audition. I had to sing, that was my first audition. And I remember singing to him, O Sole Mio. And I remember this, old gentleman looking at me in a very weird way and I said, Ma, I must be doing something very wrong. And instead, I guess I was doing something, something very right. Because right. he loved that, so he introduced me to the priest of my neighborhood. And uh, from that point, I was in a choir and... And why did you sing that song? Did you, had you just heard it in your five years of life and you knew it? Probably is the most representative song Neapolitan songs, uh, Sole Mio is uh, that, the same song that Elvis wrote, uh, sang, uh, it's now or never. So very, uh, I grew up with that music, with that song. Wow, and so what do you remember about performing in the choir? Did you perform in the choir for a while or just? For in a little church, but uh, you know, small neighborhood church, that's the same church where Enrico Caruso right. performed. And you know, and you are there with the little kids and they start to pick you for solo parts. Mm -hmm. And I saw that often I was picked as a solo part. So I become a solo singer in that choir. I had to sing during Christmas and, and that was the beginning. Uh, and how was it growing up with your four sisters? You were the only only boy of the five children, the so probably a little spoiled. Yeah, a I'm little guessing spoiled. Mama probably spoiled you. Yeah, and the sister they were taking care, good care of me. And and to, you know the the fantastic thing of living in a family with all these uh, ladies, I I have this amazing relationship with all the females surrounding me. 
uh, it's like I, I, I understand. I understand you. I understand how you think, how you feel, your sensitivity of the other gender. And that makes me mo having more girlfriend than boyfriends, to be honest. So then you had good practice then having your sisters or your, or your family and then performing for probably the majority of female audience. Um, you have that connection, yeah? I'll try. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to have that connection. Um, you know, when I'm on stage, I always say that the best thing is being yourself, like I am now with you and with them, that they are home. They will really, can really feel who I am. And I was born in this way, and I want to stay this way, no matter how what the happens. career. Yes. Yeah. I was lucky to have in my life very special coach since at the beginning. The priest of the church was a musical uh, instructor, uh -huh. and, and, and that, is, that was formed me uh, at that age, already learning on how to breathe, how to use the diaphragm, and uh, always trying to understand the gift that God gives to you, mm -hmm. that it is the voice, and the respect of that, the implement of how to make it always better and better. So in Italy, I started uh, um, until I moved to the, uh, to the United States, and of course, I didn't speak any English. So I had to start all the way from general education and get to San Jose State in California. So, so let me ask about that. When did you decide or why did you decide to, come, to make the United States your second home? And then I thought I read you, you won a uh, winning a green card lottery. How does, how does that work? How that works, yes. I remember traveling with my best friend. His name is Massimo. He's a guitar player. We're traveling around Europe and I, I met this beautiful girl. And she invited me for a summer here in the United States. She lived in Palo Alto. Oh. So I go to Palo Alto, and with my dear friend Massimo, we start to sing around and see that people really loved the Italian culture. And I say, wow, this, this is really, people really. And uh, so moving over here, she said, I would like to stay here. I love California. I love these, uh, these, these people. And she said, OK, you can definitely do that, but you will need to marry me. I say, wow, I, I, I really am not ready. I'm too young. So I say the other option will be the green card. And it is a lottery that the government offers oh, to that. many people. Very lucky to win it. I remember the American uh, consulate calling uh, uh, my home in Italy. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. I say, uh, Mr. Pasquale Esposito, you won the lottery. I say, how much? I say, <laughs> That's what I would have There's asked. There's no money involved. <laughs> uh, you can move to the United States. And actually, you need to pass a bunch of a test. And I did that. And I moved to this country and all by myself without speaking English. So I start from zero. So that's why you ended up in Northern California. It was because, because of a female. Because she was there, yeah. yeah. And why did you decide to study at San Jose State? Well, I was doing a research and looking around the country about one of the best musical program. But uh -huh. most of all, one of the best coach. And uh, I discovered that San Jose State has an amazing vocal coach. He's an opera star, worked with uh, Mr. Domingo, uh, worked with uh, Pavarotti and Hold, all the major uh, oh. tenor. His name is uh, Joseph Frank. And with him, I started this journey, and, he, and we did the music program together. I was there for uh, six years, I guess. And it was amazing. I mean, and, uh, and so you didn't speak English when you started at San Jose State? And then you were, mm. working, at, were you working on a degree there? Yes, but I, uh, when I started San Jose State, I already did two, three years at Futil College. So I had to do oh. all my GE. In order, wow. even though I had a degree in Italy, they don't recognize here in the United States. So I had to start from but scratch. But you're going to school with very little knowledge of the English language. Oh yeah, I remember going to school uh, at Futil College, taking English as second language, and uh, communicating with uh, with uh, with the the structure with hand. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it was fun with the smoke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a journey. So let's let's move forward a little bit. In 2009, you released your fifth album. Mm -hmm. Right, I read. It's called A Brand New Me. Based on the name of the title of the album, what was the album about? It's a you? beautiful album. It's an album where I finally I don't sing cover songs oh. that I loved, but it's really who I am. Uh, I was able through the years to write all this beautiful poetry and, uh, you know, hide them. And, and sometimes 
uh, you find in a position in life where you're going to open all these doors and you're going to find all these pieces of paper and I put together all that and come out with some spectacular melody and very successful album. So your first four albums were singing other people's music or someone, and so this one was your first mm -hmm. time for your music. Yes. Um, you've performed many benefits and concerts and, and started your own nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the nonprofit organization. Is it because, is that too because your passion is also mentoring students? Or are they, do the two go together? Mainly, I saw in the past, living in this country, I saw what is happening in the educational problem. And I see that unfortunately with the budget cut, art gets always secondary. And that made me incredibly sad. Because I believe inside every single one of us, there is an artist that need to be discovered. And, and, and if I can take a little kid who has been exposed constantly to one kind of music, because their parents listen to that music. Mm -hmm. And it can be any style. It can be jazz, rap, uh, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if I can tell them that there is other kind of music, I feel honor. Because it means that you're giving to this little kid the capability to look around, to understand that there is not that kind of music that they grow up with, but there is many, many genera. And music is not one thing. So you're exposing them to so much more. Yes. You know, I had, uh, I had a little kid coming to my vocal studio, and all they were able to do was rap music and uh, leaving the studio singing Ave Maria. But uh, understanding that there is nothing wrong with rap, right. but understanding that there is also a classical world that I believe, especially in singing, can give you a foundation to express yourself in any other genre. I find myself singing in jazz or blues. I love to do that. Now, tell me about some of the students that may have come in as rappers and left singing Ave Maria. How is it for them, and what did you see? Did you see a change in them or in their whole being, or what did you see? There is a, a change in the attitude towards life that would me, made me incredibly proud of seeing this little kid that, uh, you know, is walking a certain way, and when I expose him to this and thing, he understand that maybe he can use that technique that he's uh, exploring in Ave Maria to sing what he usually sings in a different way. So it is, he's discovering a new world. And probably, you know, who knows, he's gonna become the, the, the best tenor or the best <laughs> soprano in the world. Who yeah. knows, right? Just yes. the exposure is, yes. is wonderful, right? Yes. Um, okay, so let's talk about your new PBS special, Pasquale Esposito celebrates Enrico Caruso. Mm -hmm. Now there was a different working title, right? Because you, I saw it on Kickstarter. Tell me about that whole experience of the Kickstarter and why this project was so important to you. Well, Kickstarter was was uh, the possibility to give to everybody to participate to that. And I was uh, so incredibly impressed because, you know, moving in the Bay Area, I should say that I had people supporting me uh, in, in California in a tremendous way. And you see what with this Kickstarter campaign, with, I think we put together 50 or $60,000, you will see that there is a, a person who will donate $5 and a person who will donate $5,000, but with the same passion. Mm -hmm. And that's what impresses me. So the, it's so nice to see a PBS national program that is born from the people. Mm. You know, it makes it incredibly special. And why, that's why I'm so, so proud. And why was it your passion or why did you want to do the project? Why? Well, it happened to me that I was born in the same neighborhood where Enrico Caruso was born. And I grew up with this figure in my life. You know, I remember with my mother going to the market every day and she was pointing to me to a balcony and say, you know, there lived Enrico Caruso. And everybody in the neighborhood were talking about Enrico Caruso and going to the church and seeing, oh, in this choir sang Enrico Caruso. So it was, I grew up with this figure always, constantly in my life. I never understand what this gentleman was capable to do 
in the world until oh. I moved in the United States and I studied at San Jose State. And I saw the impact that he had in the music business. I mean, he was the first one to be recorded, the first one to be able to uh, say, okay, I'm here in the United States, but in Argentina are going to hear me on this disc. The other tenor, they were a little conservative and say, you know, the technology was not that great. So the voice reproducing was not the best. I say, I don't sound like that. I don't want to go like that. But he was the one to take the risk and say, okay, I'm going to put my voice there because they can hear me all, all over, over the world. Right. And he made it. I yeah. mean, and being born in a very poor neighborhood uh, with, uh, you know, the capability that he had to go out and work to bring money home to support the family, they were incredibly poor. But the mother was the one who always believed in him. So and was... so for me, it was a journey to do this PBS and trying to create a docu concert, mm -hmm. a combination. So th for those that haven't perhaps seen it on PBS yet, Tell us a little bit about it and how you came up to make it a document concert event. Incredibly innovative. When I was uh, yes. uh, speaking about this concept to uh, many, many producers, they were looking at me in a very skeptical way and say, how, how you can do that? And I say, yes, I would like to tell a story with music and with a, a travelogue going yeah. around and I say it's incredibly difficult because you will have a break people will get distracted and uh, you know I, I believed in it mm. I am a testadura like they say <laughs> so I say I know I want to do it I want to do it and and I put it together and I was so incredibly happy and proud when PBS decided to take us on board um, so now you have your are you working on a sixth album El Tiempo or in is tempo, already, it is already out. And I know you have an upcoming tour coming to the United States. Yes. Yeah. So will you perform music from the PBS special, or will it be from your latest album? Or what, what if our audience is able to join us uh, at the concert, what can they expect to see? What you know, music will I, we hear? I, I've done show over and over. Uh, I, I believe in, in, the, in the latest show that I'm touring around, it's called Pasquale, uh, uh, The Legend of a Voice. The Legend of a Voice celebrating this Enrico Caruso. But I strongly believe also in a variety in the repertoire. Mm. So people who are coming to see this show uh, are going to be enjoying different style of music, not just opera. Mm. There is a strong influence in opera that is pop opera and maybe Andrea Bocelli, Il Divo, now Il Volo, they're making mm -hmm. this style stronger. So they're going to hear a song about that repertoire. They're going to hear some American standard. Oh, really? Uh, yes, because I'll try to, to touch all kind of a style so the audience lives with something that, uh, you know, uh, pleased. Right. So in essence, there's something for everyone in the audience. Yes. And they also are exposed to either classical or um, opera or so a variety. So when you sing the American standards or the American pop stuff, what, what are some of the ones that you that you like to perform? You Is know, it an like Elvis that, song or? Last night I was uh, I, I was performing and we are you know very close to a romantic time of the year. So I said uh, le, le, let's do a, a romantic style and I put songs like Unchained Melody, My Funny Valentine, oh, All You, Stand wow. By Me. It's, it's a little medley that it's, it's a moment in the, in the, in the show where you, you really uh, will sing that song and you see that we touch everybody's hearts because music is, it, it does that, it brings back memory. Sometimes you're driving and the radio comes on of and course. a song takes you to a different place. And you go with your fantasy of that time. I always say the music we love the most is the music we heard in high school, because I think that's a, a time in our lives that we may not appreciate when we're in high school as much, but once we're not there, we're looking back at that time as perhaps some of the best times in our, yes. in our world. Um, what's maybe one or two songs <clears throat> that, you, that you love to perform because you know the audience is really going to love it? What, what are those songs? No, there are songs that they love it. Uh, there is no, uh, usually I close the show with uh, this uh, beautiful uh, aria from Puccini. It's, it's the Turandot. It's called Nessun Dorma.
and uh, it's automatic that you see people like looking at you like and, and, and even though it's a difficult song to sing at the end of a show especially when I do show that they go on for two hours you don't want to sing a, a, a B flat at the end of the show but you know I, I'll do it and, and you see the reaction of the audience that's one definitely of my favorite aria so an aria rather than yeah. a um that, that's one of because you know they're engaging with, I mean if they're engaging with you the whole time but you know that song is going to create some kind of emotion with them for sure or you leave it with them before. yes and there is no 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 uh, no one show that I don't hand with that song to be honest and they don't stand and they don't uh, stand. because you know there is this bombastic ending and you see the excitement and and the closing of a journey a beautiful song. That's a good way. Um, are there any American female artists that you would like to uh, perform with, and why? Celine Dion. Yeah, she's. Uh, yeah, she's Canadian, though. She's Canadian. Yeah, but it's all right. <laughs> um, are there any? Are there any? Uh, any others that here? Canadians fine too, but that you would like to perform with other than Celine Dion, or, or why would you like to perform with Celine? Um, what about she? Her? She really studied. Uh, she, she has a color in her voice that is spectacular. It's something that uh, really touched me, the capability, the technique, uh, the way to phrase. Uh, she means every single word, and I'm very much in that. Uh, if I'm singing and I'm like uh, not focusing on what I'm saying, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna uh, refine myself. So uh, not just saying the words. It's not you just feel saying the words. the words. You need to say the words in a musical way but not forgetting that there is a meaning behind. And this is very important. There is a meaning behind, uh, otherwise, otherwise it becomes a lullaby, you know? And, ah. and, and that's what, what makes a singer special. The capability of thinking about what you're saying. That's what Frank Sinatra used to do. Mm. You can listen to the radio that he paws and he breathed in a certain way. Same thing, Tony Bennett. You, you will see that there is a, a meaning behind their breathing, their phrasing, their color, and Celine does that very yes. well. Um, so what do you want to do next? What's next on your agenda of, of things you want to accomplish? Wow, finishing this, uh, this uh, beautiful PBS show, it took me almost two years and a half, close to three years. Now it's time to deliver this project to the, to the people. And you know, I'm all around the country and uh, I want to share uh, this project and why I want to share this project is because I believe that can be left to the next generation. Uh -huh. The example of Enrico Caruso starting from zero in a very poor neighborhood and dying uh, as an opera star. If you, can, you cannot believe the, cap the, the power and the impact that he had in the music business. You will, you will not believe that this boy born so poor without education, will be able to do that in the history of music, 18 consecutive seasons at the Metropolitan, for a gentleman who lived a very short life because he died very, very early. It's, it's an impact in the believing in himself. That's the example I want to be able to deliver to the next generation. If you believe in yourself, if you believe in the gift that God gave to you, think can happen. You know, and, and that's what the story of Enrico Caruso, of course, he becomes incredibly successful here in the United States because this is the land of the opportunity. Think about me. I come over here, I don't speak one single word in, word in English, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking like, you still don't speak English. <laughs> I, I cannot understand what you're saying. You know, you're right. But mainly, uh, that's, that's beautiful, understanding where we are. This is the land, no, no matter what the news will say, you know, this is like who is number one, who is number two. Think about this boy, I came over here 17 years ago, not speaking one word in English, uh, with a little voice that needs to be improved and, and be able to have his national show. It can happen here in the United States and I'm so proud to be an American. Oh, lovely. I want to ask you, in our, in our last minute, since we have just a second last. I know, I talk a lot, so. No, you don't. It's beautiful. Can you share just a, one job that you had while you were trying to make it big that wasn't singing, 
that you had to do because you had to support yourself. Of course. When I moved to this country, uh, when I went to that green card, they called me in an office and say, you need to go to work. I say, you know, I, I, I am a musician. I can just do music. And they say, I'm sorry, that's not a job. We'll find a job for you. And they threw me in a coffee shop on University Avenue in Palo Alto. And I was, uh, and I was there making, uh, making coffee. And I remember they put me at the cash register and someone came and they say, I would like to order uh, a latte, no fat, no foam, uh, 2%. I said, what, what, what is she talking about? <laughs> in Italy, we have just espresso and latte. So it, it was, and he said, OK, you go in the back. You're going to clean the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Pasquale, thank you so much for your time. It's been great getting to know you. I appreciate it. I had a great time, and thank you for inviting me.